And welcome back to Uregina 120. I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of Regina as part of a computer science degree. And today we're going to be talking about the Reverend Thomas Bayes. Uh, and so this is this video is not really about Bayes's rule. Uh, we are, may end up covering that in a later video. Uh, and if you are really interested in it, if you go to the 10 Ideas 50 Years video uh, and look up subjective probability and some of the other videos on that topic, uh, there is some discussion of this guy and his rule. Uh, but this video is not specifically about the statistics and specifically about uh, that particular aspect, uh, so much as just the person himself. And so it's difficult to understate how important uh, the Reverend Bayes actually was, uh, and how much we should remember him. Uh, so, like, we, we all remember uh, or know about some of the, the greatest people in history or the smartest minds in history. We talked about Isaac Newton, and I, I mean, I, Isaac Newton, in addition to being an alchemist, was also a natural philosopher and or scientist. Uh, I mean, he, he was mostly an alchemist, but again, I, he's a smart guy. We remember him because of the advances that he made in physics and astronomy and you name it. Uh, but he's certainly not the only smart cookie that has earned a place in history uh, with his name in it so that we can remember that yes, it, it's a good idea to actually pay attention to how the world works because sometimes if you're hardworking and lucky enough, uh, you can actually see something that other people won't be able to see, at least until you, uh, and that you can actually change the world as a result of it. And so this, in ad addition to your Einstein, your Newton, your you know, Archimedes, those sorts of people, Thomas Bayes deserves a spot in that list. And not nearly enough people know who he is or what he accomplished and the kinds of uh, situations that um, kind of correspond to what we should remember him by. So, you know, and, and you can go to Wikipedia. You, you can kind of look him up. I, I you know, suggest that you go do that. Go whatever your search engine is, Google, DuckDuckGo, just go check him out. Um, because I can kind of describe at a high level uh, kind of who he was and what his life was like. But again, it's it's not that important about the details of you know any specific thing that I say, so much as we should be remembering this guy. We should, we should have posters of him in our schools. We should have uh, in our you know, very, very early uh, education to be introduced to who he was, at least. Whether or not we can get through the, the ideas of, that he kind of thought up of. Hi, welcome. And uh, so, in, in general, the prior to about the kind of 17th century, there was a series of bloody revolutions in England, and there was a compromise struck between those of multiple faiths, uh, such that the nonconformists, such as the Presbyterian Church, that Bayes was a part of, uh, were allowed to exist, uh, and were allowed to continue to believe what they believed, but they weren't allowed to partake in some of the, the parts of um, society, such as the university system. So they had to basically recreate in order to continue to be educated people as a culture, uh, and there was a, a, a significant number of people in this kind of group uh, who wanted to continue to, to par participate in the, the civilization that they were a part of, uh, but were just not allowed to do so in the official manner. And so there was a, a lot of kind of rethinking of things that were done in order to create these institutions uh, in such a way that they weren't completely ruled uh, by the, the official church at the time. And so in the context of this kind of rethinking, and in, in the context of this building, rebuilding up of educational institutions, we see Thomas Bayes as, as a minister, as someone who would have gone to university, uh, he would have uh, gone to the University of Edinburgh, uh, which, by the way, there was a lot of uh, really important uh, changes that were happening in uh, Scotland at that time, uh, including uh, the kind of opening up of uh, knowledge uh, and the loosening of the control of um, knowledge from booksellers uh, at the time. So there was a lot of really big changes in the way that the world was moving. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, there was, of course, Isaac Newton uh, was changing the way that we looked at the world about that time. And uh, so there, there would have been reasons to kind of look at the world in a different way, uh, which 
he may have been able to capitalize on. And so, uh, uh, and unfortunately, we only have so much details uh, from his life because a lot of the church records that would have described m in more details kind of his background, uh, the particulars of his life uh, were secret and were not kept uh, out of fear of religious persecution and out of fear of the kinds of kind of violence that was common in England about that time uh, as, as pertains to religion. So uh, we have this guy, we, we don't remember him nearly as much as we could, uh, but at, at the same time there's, uh, he, he, he has come up with these ideas. And so his kind of main uh, areas of, of focus from his extant writings uh, tended to be in the math, uh, in science, uh, in celestial, uh, celestial mechanics and astronomy, and kind of as a miscellaneous thinker on general and broad topics. So within math, he would have gone into and come up with r results from trigonometry, geometry, uh, differential equations, uh, electricity, or from science, he was into already in the kind of mid uh, 18th century, uh, the study of electricity. Uh, he was uh, in interested in uh, weights and uh, the kind of measurement of weight and physical objects. Uh, in optics, in harmony, in music even. Uh, so th this is a guy who is uh, fairly eclectic uh, and he had a lot of kind of uh, knowledge of a, of a lot of places, including electricity, that uh, there would be in the future a lot of progress on. And so that we know there are other mathematical results that uh, Bayes discovered uh, but didn't publish, or that he discovered and wrote down but nobody really recognized at the time. Uh, I found it in kind of researching this video, he came up with a couple of things that Euler came up with, uh, another great mathematician of kind of a later time, uh, and but decade, or decade and a half before Euler got to it. Uh, so uh, th this is a guy who's uh, kind of at the forefront of mathematics, at the forefront of science. And uh, a lot of, or some of the things that he came up with, including his Bayes' rule, which we'll discuss a little bit, Uh, that uh, so there was uh, that th that particular rule was in a paper that was only published after his death, and so there was the things that were going on uh, that uh, was would would only kind of come out after he, he died, and because of it, he wasn't there to defend his ideas. So even though he came up with some of the great ideas that we're now basing our, our civilization on. Uh, he wasn't there to kind of tell people that they were important and that the, the kind of status quo way of looking at the world at the time was not the way of going about things. And so one of the things that he did uh, was that he defended the idea of calculus uh, and he defended Newton's ideas uh, when Newton himself uh, did not, again, because of the kind of secrecy surrounding the way he approached things, as we described in detail in the last video, uh, there were some details of how calculus works uh, that Newton really did not uh, either let the public know or know himself. Uh, and so uh, the great minds of his time, including uh, guys like Berkeley, uh, would have uh, disagreed with, in principle, some of the conclusions from it uh, because of the, the, the lack of rigor in how calculus was actually being used at the time. And so one of the things that the Reverend Thomas Bayes was before, or, or uh, the kind of forefront of that, was defending and, and making more rigorous the way that we perceive calculus uh, at the time, and which has, of course, persisted to this day. We use calculus for practically everything. Uh, and so a lot of what we uh, kind of think of when we think of calculus, although Newton was the first to come up with it, the reason that we believe it is because of Bayes and people like Bayes actually doing the legwork of, of making sure that uh, it was um, kind of well thought through. And indeed, he was one of the first people who truly understood how calculus works and how to use it. And so he kind of was a trailblazer in actually taking this new idea and making it apply in real situations in the sciences and kind of showing the rest of us how it could be done.
Uh, he was, of course, a, a, a reverend, so he was into religious topics. Uh, he tried to make the case uh, and um, apparently did a good enough job uh, to become a local celebrity uh, that the uh, principal end of God's creating us uh, was that for us to be happy. And so this was kind of his way of justifying and, and kind of viewing the world. And again, he was successful enough in arguing this uh, that, again, the, the greatest minds of his time at least had something to say on the matter and on his particular arguments. And so this is not a lightweight. Th this guy is a a, you know, one of the, the better scientists of the day, uh, one of the better thinkers of the day, has access to the most powerful tools of the day, and is, is, is kind of shaking the foundations of how uh, the smartest people in the world view uh, themselves and their relationship in terms of their system of, of, of worldview. And so one of the things that he was going to be uh, kind of shaking down uh, is the idea of how to deal with uh, the fact that our sense organs and our institutions and uh, our ways of looking at the world and all of these things are imperfect and so you know if you look at the screen uh, your your eyes are not perfect lenses uh, your um, if you wear glasses you may have scratches on your glasses and so the question is what happens if you kind of observe something uh, multiple times can you infer from those multiple uh, kind of looks or, or, or senses uh, or uh, ways of looking at it, uh, the truth behind that thing, or the real structure of that thing. And is it possible uh, that if you were to observe an infinite number of times, could you get uh, the actual truth behind it? And up until uh, Bayes, uh, so from the perspective of, say, Hume or Descartes, or some of the kind of other great minds of his time, the idea was that you could kind of keep uh, increasing the amount of times you'd observe things, you could keep uh, looking, you could keep checking, you could look in different ways, uh, but you're always kind of getting more information out of it in such a way that it kind of converges on the truth eventually, and that if you think carefully about what you're seeing, and if you kind of treat your observations right, uh, you can kind of get at the truth behind it. And Bayes had a little bit more subtle view of this, uh, in that he uh, incorporated the, uh, the uncertainty of that was kind of part of the, the act of observing, er, observing uh, right into his view of what the thing was that he was kind of dealing with and in such a way that you would probably recognize as modern when we start talking about Schrodinger's cat uh, where you have uh, something that the uncertainty of whether the cat is alive or dead is kind of encoded into our view of what the cat is in itself. Uh, that, that's kind of a complicated way of looking at it, but it just kind of gives you a feel of the kinds of things that he was trying to do, the kinds of ways that he was kind of trying to reformulate how we look at the world, uh, and how we look at truth, and how we look at getting truth uh, from the outside world, using observation, using science, etc. And a lot of the, the kind of, I mean, th th this, this is a person who is probably, uh, you know, as, as a, a, a or adult living at the time, uh, he probably played a, at least some deal of cards. And s at least one of his results uh, is due to the, the question of what are the odds in a particular game, I think it's pronounced Whisk, uh, when you have uh, each player has 13 cards in his hand except for the dealer, the dealer has 12, what is the odds of having, or the dealer having four trumps? Uh, this is a zero-sum game, and so this is something that it w would have been an example of the sort of thing that he would have approached, and that particular question uh, would have led to something uh, like what we were, uh, or we would kind of experience as modern probability theory and his doctrine of the chances. And so specifically, the, the, his doctrine of the chances is, is probably his best work, uh, and it's not that long. I've read it, and it's it's readable enough. Uh, if you really don't have a strong math background, you can probably skip it uh, until you do. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's, it's a short paper and it gives insight. So uh, if you, you know, take anything out of this video, other than that he existed, it's to go put this on your reading list somewhere because it's a good read uh, and it, it's very fruitful to do so. And so he, he wrote this book and then he died and nobody really uh, paid any attention to it. 
uh, for the most part. Uh, there are some exceptions, but uh, it wasn't really into, until Laplace, a uh, French mathematician, uh, and until someone actually really understood it and, and started to apply it. But even Laplace, uh, though he kind of got it, uh, he, he got it for a little bit and then he, he kind of let it go. And then he found something else to, to occupy his time with and occupy the, the way that he viewed the world. Uh, and so it wasn't really until the, the Second World War that people really got how important his results were. And so uh, it was used in the Second World War. It was used by Alan Turing uh, in his cracking of the German codes. Uh, and in general, uh, by the Second World War, this was it was starting to become clear how important his results were. And that even the, uh, up until that point, if there were people who, who got it, they were still at heart uh, what are called frequentists. Uh, they would have viewed uh, data as valid within the, now, within the bounds of their knowledge, rather than uh, using Bayes' world to account for their ignorance directly into their model of the world itself, which we'll kind of get into as we go. But it, again, it's, it's the, the up until the Second World War, uh, even if they people kind of had memorized his equation or kind of knew about him and knew about what he did, they really didn't internalize it and, and get to using it in the best way uh, possible until, again, the Second World War. And unfortunately, uh, the Second World War, when it ended, uh, there was uh, Churchill specifically ordered evidence that Bayes' rule was used uh, to remain secret uh, and remain a military secret. And so the, the world really didn't find out, uh, well, first of all, that Bayes' rule was used in breaking these codes. Um, which they were uh, afraid that the Soviets would learn and then stop using codes that could be broken with it. Uh, but kind of more important than that, uh, the only people in the world who really had access to uh, a, a skilled uh, kind of way of using it was the NSA and the GHCQ uh, in Britain. And so there's kind of a disparity between the, the, the kind of view of uncertainty and how it can be used uh, in these intelligence agencies versus the rest of the world. And because of that, it wasn't until about 1973 uh, that, well, for one, that we really knew that what had happened, uh, and for two, that this, it became apparent how important it was and how useful it was, and the fact that it could be used in a wide variety of fields, uh, all the way from life insurance to artillery to theology to networking to econometrics to computer science, decision theory, economics, military strategy, the whole field. And so the, the idea that this thing could be used, that his ideas could were actually uh, workable enough to, to solve big problems like breaking the Enigma code, like finding hidden submarines, like uh, directing artillery shells, uh, all of these things and much more, uh, it was, again, more or less a secret or uh, not nearly widespread as it could be uh, until about the 70s. And part of the problem is that uh, the there, there, there were reasons, uh, practical reasons as well, uh, Bayes' rule, um, and again, we're not going to go into exactly how it works, uh, but you need to be able to do some math to, to use it. And it, the more uh, kind of results you need from it, uh, the more computing power you need. So Bayes would not have had access to a, a computer powerful enough to actually really make use of it, again, because computers didn't exist yet when he lived, uh, but later thinkers certainly would not have uh, had that problem, uh, even going kind of as far back as the late uh, 19th and mid 20th century. Uh, there, there would have been uh, places where you could have used this if it wasn't a military secret. And so, kind of a, as a broad overview, before we get into basis rule and how it kind of operates, uh, we need to understand a couple of things. Uh, one is that the concept of a prior. And so what is a prior? Uh, a prior is a, a, a probability, so this is going to be something from 0% to 100%, uh, although it doesn't necessarily have to be a probability. It could be a, an entire probability distribution or something like it. Uh, it all that really matters is that uh, it kind of corresponds to how you, you view something before you get evidence about it. 
Uh, so if you think that a dice is a fair dice, um, your prior is your belief that it's a fair dice before you flip it, or your belief that it'll go come up heads before you flip it, or it's your belief that it'll come up tails before you flip it. So that this is kind of a, a, a way of viewing belief, uh, a way of expecting evidence uh, for something that you have not observed yet. Uh, and so this is going to usually be in the form of a number, uh, but the data structure of that number, how you present that number, uh, how much data you store about that number, uh, all of those sorts of questions which you could get into uh, when we actually start doing programs to, to make this work, um, it, none of that really matters. All that really matters is that uh, there is some data and it corresponds to what you'd expect uh, if you observe something. And so Bayes' original idea is that if you aren't sure, or one of uh, the ways that Bayes would have treated priors, uh, is that if you're not sure which prior to believe, uh, you believe all available priors with equal probability. So if you have a coin and you're not sure if it's uh, going to come up heads or tails, uh, that you have a kind of an equal probability between the two of them, so 50% one, 50% the other. And if the coin turns out to be not a fair coin, uh, you can change these probabilities after you get some evidence of that, but you start out with just believing that they're 50 and 50, like that. And if you have more than two possible outcomes of an event, so let's say you have a uh, four-sided dice, Again, until you have evidence that it's not a fair dice, you allocate your, your chances kind of equal to them, uh, and you have uh, a result that you can then act on, and you can predict based on, and you can bet based on. And the, the important part is that uh, your in uncertainty is kind of used when you're guessing, and your uncertainty kind of helps you to tell what to actually expect. And we'll get, or we may get into the, the exact mechanisms of how that works in a later video, but the important part again is when we're thinking about these priors, we're, we're talking about something that happens before you do an experiment, before you observe something, before you open your eyes and look at that something. And uh, that's kind of something that he is going to use as we go. Uh, so, and during his lifetime, his view of his basis rule uh, was kind of looked down on, and it challenged the way that we looked at data, uh, and it challenged the way that we looked at statistics at the time, uh, and he, people thought that he would be forgotten, and they openly said as much at the time. And after he died, of course, people did build, continue to vilify him, and he wasn't there to defend himself, and so, again, it took uh, until about the 1970s for people to really think about the consequences of viewing things in, in this kind of way. And so as mentioned, you, you need a lot of computing power to use basis rule, uh, and there are ways of kind of shortcutting around that, including Markov chain and Monte Carlo methods, uh, which you can then use to, to speed the, the application of it up substantially uh, to the point where it's m even more, com or it's not even competitive, but vastly superior than other ways of doing statistics. Uh, now that's a little, the, how this works is of course a little bit beyond the scope of this video, but it's just worth uh, mentioning. And so we have this idea of priors. And the other thing that we want to have the idea of, before we even get to uh, Bayes' rule and how it works, uh, is that we're when, or during the 18th century, uh, the kind of British Empire had expanded throughout the globe. Uh, and they had access to uh, data from the ancient Romans, from the ancient Egyptians before them. Uh, they were in contact with China. They were uh, just about to start the Opium Wars. There was kind of all sorts of it, kind of ancient documents from China uh, and other kingdoms, former and current, all around the world. Uh, and they were getting data about the stars, about the kind of maps of the world, uh, all sorts of scientific findings from everyone in the world at that point. Uh, and so some of these scientific findings were in good quality, 
uh, and some of them were. And there were observations that were reliable, and then there was observations that were not reliable. When you're dealing with uh, non-Bayesian statistics, usually the approach that you take is to take data that isn't uh, perfect, that data that you have reasons to suspect that isn't actually valid, and to just throw it out. And that was what was happening at the time. But again, people uh, were looking at these ancient documents and saying, well, most of this is still good, or at least some of this is still accurate. And so is there any way we can take the, the, the good data from it in a systematic way uh, so that we can have um, take, say, Egyptian data, Roman data, and current observations, and from those, by some method, come up with some predictions that's equally informed from all of them to the extent that they're actually valid data. And is there a way to do that systematically? That was kind of the, the question of the time, and it's worth thinking about, uh, so that you don't have to waste the t thousands of years of observations that the Egyptians did and the thousands of years of, uh, or at least many hundreds of years of Roman observations as well. You can build upon them, stand on the shoulders of giants, etc. And the other thing that uh, Bayes' rule allows uh, is for you to uh, do better, uh, or to basically look at the world in a subjective rather than an objective way, and to actually act on subjective beliefs rather than just objective beliefs. And we go into this in detail in the 10 Ideas 50 Years uh, uh, video on the subject of probability, uh, but it's worth mentioning here as well that this dates to him. This is his idea, uh, or, or at least he was one of the first people to articulate it in a way that makes it actually work. So uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of, we're, we're at this point now where you know, we, we've described the, the kind of backdrop of basis rule uh, and who he was, his kind of environment, etc. Uh, he, he's changed an awful lot on the way that we look at the world, uh, and he definitely should be remembered. But it, it might be worth kind of closing with this quote from him, where he points out, quote, Why, if I'm half blind, must I take for my guide one that can't see at all? Uh, unquote. So, you know, he's not able to fully understand the world. He's not able to fully, you know, predict things that are coming. He's not able to uh, kind of wrap his mind around all of the data. Uh, he would probably consider himself half-blind uh, in the way that he kind of looked at the world. You know, a lot of things can happen. A lot of data can change. We can be misled. We can be lied to, etc. Uh, but the, the important thing is that we shouldn't, because of that, just give up. And we shouldn't just throw away good data uh, on the basis that the entire set uh, isn't perfect and that we don't have access to the, the kind of perfect way of, of living, the perfect uh, view of things. Uh, that we can take what we have and work with it. And we can take what we have and act as optimal as possible, kind of going back to the uh, video on optimization problems, uh, based on what we have rather than what we would like to have or what we would imagine is possible. Um, that we can act and, and live based, like, again, on what we have in front of us rather than what we'd like to have in front of us. So hopefully this makes sense. Is there any questions from the audience today? No questions? Okay. Well, um, as usual, if there are any questions, feel free to ask them uh, about uh, Thomas Bayes and his life uh, anywhere where this video is posted. Uh, and. Uh, as usual, there should be a Bitcoin donation address at the bottom somewhere, so that if you're interested in uh, funding our whiteboard marker supply, we can continue to do these videos for you. And as usual, hopefully uh, you tune in next video.